Hi, my name is Lee Thomas. I'm a therapist based in Fredericton, New Brunswick on unceded Wollastook land. And I would like to talk to you today about disillusionment. I grew up in a small town in Northern Alberta. And like a lot of kids in my town, I had asthma from a really young age. And my town was and is a very industrial town with lumber mills and gravel pits and oil rigs. And growing up, I remember my mom saying, you know, I'm pretty sure the reason that all of you have asthma is because of all the pollution here. And I remember us making fun of her as if that was just the most ridiculous thing we had ever heard. Because asthma was mostly genetic, duh. And if environment is such a big deal, then wouldn't everyone in my class have asthma? And besides, even if that were true, it's not like there's anything we can do about the environment. So we'll just have to figure out how to live with it. And these days, I feel like that's what a lot of my conversations about youth mental health are like. I started getting involved in the field of youth mental health because of my own experiences as a youth with mental illness. And for several years, I worked as a mental health advocate, sitting in boardrooms and doing presentations and consulting on projects to share my perspective as a youth. And every organization I worked with, whether it was a student union or an international research project was kind of asking the same question. And it's pretty much the one we're asking tonight. How can we better support young people's mental health? And throughout my time in this field, I worked alongside some really brilliant, dedicated people. And we would do this research and these surveys and these pilot projects and initiatives about youth mental health. And we kept getting the same result. People were saying, we are not okay. We are overwhelmed. We need less stress and more resources. We feel like we are being crushed by colonialism and capitalism and trauma, and we are exhausted. We are drowning in our lives. All of our energy is dedicated to staying afloat and we're miserable, but we're afraid that if we stop, we will die. And we would say, thank you for your time. And we would take this research and we would package it up into some sort of report and we would put it out there for someone to do something with. And then we would start a new research project, a new pilot project with a question like, how can we better support young people's mental health? And for a while, I really couldn't figure out what was happening there because it felt like, did we not get the answer to that already? And then I realized there was a second part to that question. That the question wasn't, how can we better support young people's mental health? Because we have so much information about how to do that already. The question was, how can we better support young people's mental health without actually changing anything? And we kept getting answers back that said, we can't, which is why we always needed to do another project to ask the question again, in the hopes that we would get a different answer. And I don't actually think we've come to a point where we've stopped doing that because we're asking the same question tonight. Because if we acknowledge that we have an answer already, it would mean that we'd have to do something about it. And we don't want to, because we don't want it to be the environment. Because when we suggest that the reason that kids are struggling is because their lives are difficult and unsustainable and that they won't stop struggling until that stops being true, people look at us the way that I looked at my mom back in the 90s. I started working as a private practice therapist in the summer of 2020. So it's been, as we keep hearing, unprecedented circumstances. It feels in many ways like the curtain has been pulled back and more people are seeing the gears of our world working the way that they actually do, not the way that we'd always been told that they do. And youth perhaps see this more than anyone, partly because they're at an age where they'd be noticing that anyway, and partly because this is now all they've ever known. They saw themselves being herded into schools, not because medical professionals deemed it was safe, but because corporations deemed it was necessary. They've seen governments talk about reconciliation one day and arrest water protectors the next. They've seen powerful organizations make promises that things will change. Then they see those organizations do nothing to fulfill these promises and they see that there's no repercussions to doing that. They're seeing how grotesquely unfair these systems are, how much of the suffering they see is unnecessary and by design. And it makes them feel furious and powerless and hopeless because why wouldn't it? How could it not? 
What I'm suggesting here is not that things are hopeless. It's that hope itself just isn't enough. We have the answers, but we need to be brave enough to act on them. If all the frogs in a pond are sick, you don't look at the frogs, you look at the pond. Thank you.